Tonight, a White House homecoming. A pastor released from a Turkish prison after two years offers the president his thanks and a prayer. What happened to Jamal Khashoggi? Did the missing Saudi journalist manage to record his own murder? We're riding along an F-15. We're with the U.S. Air Force and NATO for exercises above Ukraine. Michael's massive toll, 18 dead, 11,000 already registered for federal relief as rescue workers dig through debris, searching for hundreds still missing. A community outrage. A white woman calls police, saying she was groped by a nine-year-old black child. But what really happened? And why is she now apologizing? And come for a visit, stay for a job. The state luring tourists with the promise of a life-altering vacation. This is NBC Nightly News with Jose diaz Ballard. Good evening. A powerful scene today at the White House, two years in the making. American pastor Andrew Brunson imprisoned in Turkey on terrorism charges that many say were suspect at best is home tonight. His first stop, the Oval Office, to thank President Trump for intervening on his behalf. It was a moment many had prayed for, including the administration's evangelical base. Those prayers answered and new prayers offered. Shelley O'Donnell is at the White House. A long-awaited embrace on American soil. A motorcade escorted Andrew Brunson from Joint Base Andrews to the White House, where the North Carolina native and his wife Noreen headed for the Oval Office after a two-year odyssey in Turkey. They fought so hard for you. They wanted you out. The pastor, whose freedom became a cause for government officials and faith leaders, expressed his family's gratitude. And we especially want to thank the administration. But then, in a stunningly personal expression for such a public moment... We would like to pray for you. We pray for you often. He dropped to one knee and asked to pray for President Trump. Lord God, I ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on President Trump, that you give him supernatural wisdom to accomplish all the plans you have for this country and for him. A mix of relief and resolve. The president packed the Oval Office with invited guests, the Secretary of State, National Security Advisor, and North Carolina's congressmen and senators. We welcome the pastor back to North Carolina. The president touted his administration's success, bringing a number of detained Americans home. Basking in a joy-filled reunion, the president turned to the pastor's wife with a notably conspicuous exchange. <laughs> Could I ask you one question? Who did you vote for? <laughs> <laughs> I knew the answer. Votes were clearly on his mind as the president immediately headed to a campaign rally in Kentucky, reminiscing about his own winning year. The safe return of Pastor Brunson is a diplomatic accomplishment that President Trump is clearly happy to showcase. Brunson's homecoming resonates with Christian conservatives, a voting bloc the president relies on heavily and needs to motivate over these next three weeks to turn out for midterm races. Jose? Kelly O'Donnell at the White House, thank you. Now, the latest on the journalist feared murdered in the Saudi consulate in Turkey. Today is Jamal Khashoggi's birthday, and in an op-ed published tonight in the New York Times, his fiancée says, quote, the silence of Saudi Arabia fills me with dread. That haunting question doesn't leave me for a single moment. Is it true? Have they assassinated Jamal? Those are the same questions President Trump says he wants answered. Our chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel, has the latest from Istanbul. Richard. Good evening, Jose. Did Jamal Khashoggi solve his own murder? In a new statement today, Saudi Arabia again denied killing the journalist, but it has yet to provide any evidence showing that he left the Saudi consulate here in Istanbul alive. Turkey says it has graphic recordings that prove 15 Saudi agents murdered journalist Jamal Khashoggi inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Recordings President Trump addressed for the first time today. We've all heard a lot about the audio. Nobody's seen it yet. We're uh, going to be seeing it very soon. But President Trump made it clear what he doesn't want to happen, regardless of what the tapes may show. Losing a multi-billion dollar Saudi arms deal. I actually think we'd be punishing ourselves if we did that. There are other things we can do that are very, very powerful, very strong, and we'll do that. 
Turkish officials insist the recordings are specific and damning, and they're convinced that the Saudi hit team flew into Istanbul, abused, killed, and dismembered Khashoggi, then headed back to the airport. But now there's a new twist on this story. A pro-government newspaper in this country is reporting that when Khashoggi walked into the Saudi consulate, he was wearing an Apple watch synced to a phone here outside, and that the watch was recording. So he was able to secretly record his own torture and death. So perhaps Khashoggi outwitted his assassins and recorded them in the act. But that doesn't answer a key question. Where is Khashoggi's body? Two chartered Saudi planes left Istanbul the day he went missing. Only one was searched. Richard Engel, NBC News, Istanbul. An overwhelming challenge in Florida's panhandle today. Residents and rescuers search for hundreds of missing people in the wake of Hurricane Michael. As the death toll rises, thousands are desperate for help. NBC's Tammy Leitner is with them in Florida and brings us this report. With every hour, the search becomes more desperate. There was a list of 250 individuals uh, that was received of individuals that chose to stay behind. Rescuers combing through rubble in Mexico Beach, Florida. We looked in every house up and down. Hoping to find the missing in a seemingly unending landscape of devastation. Search and rescue. Today, they found no one. This quiet vacation town of just more than 1,000 decimated by Hurricane Michael. Nearly every home damaged. Many wiped off their foundations or flattened. In some cases, a picture or piece of clothing, the only indication it was someone's home. It is totally destroyed. Emily Mitchell can hardly bear to look at her parents' house. They didn't have insurance, and now they may not be able to rebuild. The only thing we know to do is tear it down and have the lot. We don't know what we're going to be able to do. I know it's just a beach house, but it has a lot of memories for us. Residents and rescuers alike face growing concerns, epitomized by Panama City. There is no power or water here, and not enough food for those who stayed behind. Total devastation, like bombs went off. Nearby Lynn Haven was hit hard. Some evacuated. Others, like Scott Howard, wish they had. I knew it was going to be bad, but it was way worse than I expected. Tonight, flood warnings remain in effect in Virginia, where five people died. Michael's wrath still being realized even today. Here in Florida, Governor Rick Scott announced today that 11,000 people have already applied for federal help. The rescues will continue for days here, and the rebuilding process could take years. Jose? Tommy Leitner in Mexico Beach, Florida, thank you. U.S. F-15 fighter jets landed in Ukraine this week, flying beyond the borders of NATO in the first air exercises with Ukraine since Russia annexed Crimea four years ago. Our Pentagon correspondent Hans Nichols climbed into an F-15 to watch the exercises from the air. Here is his exclusive report. Clear skies over contested land. Russia just 300 miles or a few supersonic minutes away. U.S. and Ukrainian fighter jets training together. A show of air power, pulling 7Gs and barrel rolls. Sending Moscow a message that the U.S. is helping Ukraine bolster its defenses. If we saw a Russian jet up here, what would be your response? I'd be more excited than I would be scared, quite frankly. Anytime you see a dissimilar aircraft in the sky and it's a fighter, you want to check it out. The U.S. checking out Russia's air assets. For the first time, American pilots here in Ukraine are getting a close look at the Su-27. It's a Russian-made fighter. Now, it's being flown by Ukrainians who will allow the Americans to see how it handles in a mock dogfight. General Clay Garrison says Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014 forced Ukraine to rethink how it can defend its airspace. Ukraine is a country at war. So that all adds in kind of the feeling of the exercise, the importance of it, and everyone that's here gets that. For Ukrainian pilots, a first-hand look at NATO standards. The country, under President Poroshenko, pursuing closer ties with the military alliance. We're learning a lot from NATO, 
and NATO learning a lot from Ukrainian soldiers who fight in the condition of the Russian hybrid war. And this is the win-win form of cooperation. Even if it risks antagonizing Russia. And we do not ask the permission from Russia what we should do on our soil. Or who they train with in their skies. Hans Nichols, NBC News, Stero Konstantina, Ukraine. Today in upstate New York, friends and family gathered for funerals for eight of the 20 people killed in that horrible limousine crash one week ago. 17 friends were celebrating a birthday when their limo crashed into a parking lot. The operator of the limo company has since been arrested. Police say the car should not have been on the road. Tonight, a community in Brooklyn is outraged after a white woman accused a nine-year-old African-American child of groping her. She then called police, but security footage from the scene tells a very different story, and tonight, that woman is apologizing. Here's Matt Bradley. No, I want the cops here right now. Video shot Wednesday outside a Brooklyn convenience store has become the latest focus of outrage over alleged racism, with over 5 million views. That's right, the sun grabbed my she said, and she decided to yell at me. Teresa Klein accused a nine-year-old boy of sexual assault. It's unclear if she was faking the call. And I am going home. Goodbye, not yeah, I know. operator. Police say they have no record of it. Upload that to world star. Go away. And the store's surveillance video tells a different story clearly showing the boy's backpack accidentally brushed against Klein. She was immediately given a nickname. Corner store Carolyn. Joining Barbecue Becky, Permit Patty, and Pool Patrol Paula, white people filmed calling the police on black people for seemingly minor infractions. Also this week, a black man babysitting two white children was reported to police in Georgia, and the felony conviction of a Michigan man who fired on a young boy who was asking for directions. Back in Brooklyn, last night, a dramatic scene. Klein returned to the store and reviewed the footage, taunted by a crowd. What the boy's hand? Where the hell is Then she backed down. Young man, I don't know your name, but I'm sorry. Apology or not, commentators say her first reaction speaks to the everyday challenges black people face, especially young people. In America, black children aren't even seen as children. The fact that she looked at a black child and didn't see a black child, that is a bigger issue. Raising questions of racism under social media's glaring spotlight. Matt Bradley, NBC News, New York. Here we go. In a small town in upstate New York, something exciting is going on in the high school. It's a new kind of class that's inspiring the kids and the community by teaching them how to start a business. And there might be some good lessons here, both for schools and business owners. We get more from NBC's Rahe Maelis. Okay. All right. You guys are doing awesome. 13-year-old Kira Barney's high school isn't just about reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's about business. I think it's pretty cool because it gives you like a head start on seeing what the businesses are like. Tiger Ventures in upstate New York is rethinking traditional education. It's project based, so it's quite fun. Here, six entrepreneurs were invited to bring their startups to the school, rent free space. In exchange, the founders work side by side with students. As I expand my operations, I have a readily trained cadre of students graduating from here that I can employ full-time. The hope is that these companies will train high school students in the jobs of the future, helping them stay in the area and attracting new businesses to the town's slumping Main Street. Indicott was the birthplace of IBM. The company sold its plant number one in 2002, ending a decade of massive job cuts here. Today, many kids from struggling families are seeing opportunity for the first time. Coming here completely changed my mindset about going to school. The school is supported by the XQ Institute, a foundation committed to reimagining high schools nationwide. We have a system of our high schools, actually, that is nearly 100 years old. In fact, they have not kept pace with the rest of industry in our country. Superintendent Suzanne McLeod brought the idea to Endicott's. Everyone is on track to graduate. Our other hope is that in their work with the entrepreneurs in the incubator, they're also kind of developing a vision for themselves of what do I want to do, what do I want to be, 
and perhaps even what business do I want to start? A business plan for a school and a town with a brighter future. Rahima Ellis, NBC News.